First unilateral withdrawal from Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Whittingdale. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I start by congratulating my honourable friend on obtaining this debate, which is on an extremely important subject and is extremely timely as well. Um, as one or two have already said, I want to start by making it clear that we have no quarrel with the Russian people. Indeed, we have a considerable history and indeed affection for the Russian people. Um, that dates back, obviously, originally Queen Victoria times, but since then this country has supported Russia. Um, immediately before the revolution was the establishment of the Anglo-Russian Hospital, in which my father served as a medical orderly, first in Petrograd, as it was then called, and then on the Eastern Front, um, immediately prior to the revolution. And then, of course, in the Second World War, this country supported the Arctic convoys in supplying uh, essential food to the Russian people with the loss of 85 merchant ships and 16 Royal Navy warships. And I'm glad that the Russian government uh, more recently uh, acknowledged that with the award of medals yeah. to those who have survived. I can remember when I worked for Margaret Thatcher, the establishment of her relationship with Mikhail Gorbachev, who saw that the system over which he was presiding was flawed and would ultimately fail. And I think history should give him credit for the fact that when the Soviet Union did come to break up, and when Lithuania as the first country within the Soviet Union declared independence from it, Gorbachev decided not to release the troops from their barracks. And as a result, those countries obtained independence. All of that has changed and deteriorated under Vladimir Putin, as a number of the speakers in this debate have already set out. There was a brief time when there were signs of hope. Um, for those who have read Michael McFall, the for former US ambassador's book on the attempt of the Obama administration uh, to obtain what they were called reset, uh, there was a brief period where it appeared that things were becoming slightly more liberal. That did not last. It was principally when um, uh, Medvedev was president, and then when Putin came back as president, things deteriorated very quickly, with indeed Mr. McFall being declared persona non grata within Russia. And since then, there has been ruthless suppression. The first victims of Putin are the Russian people. Uh, yeah. And the strategy which my honourable friend and others have described is multifaceted, and it is pursued on a number of fronts. But the first thing is a ruthless suppression of any opposition or dissent within Russia itself. And that, of course, extends as far as murder. And we have seen Boris Nemtsov killed. We've seen Alexei Navalny poisoned and now currently detained in a concentration camp, uh, a, a, cons a corrective labor camp. And in this country, we have seen the murder of Alex Alexander Litvinenko and so, uh, the attempted murder of Sergei Skripal, which, of course, led to the death of a British citizen, Dawn Sturgis. And there are suggestions that a number of other deaths in this country um, are linked to the activities of the Russian security services. There has also been massive suppression of human rights. Most recently, the Memorial International Human Rights Organization has been closed down by the courts. And my own area of particular interest has always been in media freedom. Media freedom does not exist in Russia. As Reporters Without Borders most recently said, and I quote from their, their assessment, with draconian laws, website blocking, internet cuts and leading news outlets reined in or throttled out of existence, the pressure on independent media has grown steadily. And there are currently 373 journalists imprisoned within Russia itself. There is then the uh, strategy which is adopted towards Russia's neighbours. Uh, there has been mention made of the uh, occupation of South Ossetia and Abkhazia in Georgia, Transnistria in Moldova, and then, of course, in Ukraine with the Crimea and Donbass. And there is the threats made to neighbours. Um, when I was in Lithuania, uh, we were shown the Savelki Gap, which is the short stretch of land um, along the Polish border, which links 
Belarus and Kaliningrad under Russian occupation, and oh, it's part of the Russia itself. And if that were taken, it would cut off all three Baltic states completely from the West. And there is already reports of the use of migrants being driven into that gap, which some fear is an attempt. But it is, of course, Ukraine, which is currently in the front line. Um, Ukraine committed the cardinal sin of wanting to move towards becoming a more free and democratic society. And when Yanukovych attempted to suppress that, the Ukrainian people turned out in their thousands to protest, and a hundred died under sniper fire in the Maidan. Shortly after that, Putin uh, occupied Crimea, first denying that he had any responsibility, the famous little green men, but then subsequently ce um, celebrated by Putin. It was followed by the activity in the Donbass region, uh, and again, of course, there was the appalling murder of 283 passengers and 15 civilians, uh, crew members, who died when MH17 was shot down as part of that. And Putin now is pursuing a policy in the Donbass of issuing passports. Uh, over 600,000 have been given to Ukrainian citizens uh, within the Donbass region, which, as President Zelensky has pointed out, was the precursor strategy used in Crimea. And I went to visit uh, with Michael Fallon, uh, the, the two ports, Berdyansk and Mariupol, which are part of the Sea of Azov, which is now uh, being cut off as a result of the building of the bridge across the Kirsch Strait, which allows Russia to squeeze uh, those ports and stop any shipping going through. Ukraine is in the front line, and we heard the Foreign Secretary's very welcome statement. But as I suggested earlier, the threat of massive consequences is extremely unspecific. And at the moment, the only concrete statement that has been made by the government as to the precise re uh, results of any um, Russian military action against Ukraine was the statement by the Secretary of State for Defence that it was highly unlikely that anyone was going to send troops. I don't disagree that NATO, uh, uh, Ukraine is not a NATO member at present, and I don't think there would be great willingness to deploy military troops. But we do need to do far more in terms of military assistance and to set out very clearly what the consequences will be of Russia's current tactic, which, as I say, is not just a threat to Ukraine, but it is to uh, repress its own people internally and to pursue an aggressive strategy of expansion outside. Putin respects strength. Currently, we are not showing much, and I fully endorse the call of my honourable friend and others that we need to have a clear strategy to demonstrate to him that we cannot accept the current behaviour of the Russian government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John Hall.